Thank you, Mark, and uh, welcome. Um, what was really a lot of fun was watching that uh, Ralph pre-recorded thing as he introduced everyone here. It reminded me of that Apple commercial where the George Orwell guy was, you know, there talking and everything. But um, I, I wanted to thank uh, both Ralph and Mark and Esri for, for hosting this particular session. And welcome to everyone online. Uh, my name's Paul. Uh, I'm a recovering architect. I'm in a 12-step program. Uh, I'm also a builder, uh, but I actually own a company now that does real estate development. So our use of BIM is a little different, only because uh, it's actually my money that I'm spending working, and it better work, right? So uh, we've actually uh, gone back in time at certain points, going back to CAD, when we can't make BIM do what it has to do. Uh, we actually then also move forward, where we actually uh, look at BIM as almost a framework. And as Mark was showing, uh, the integrations of like gaming engines and that type of thing. Uh, so you're going to see an interesting hybrid, but I think it brings out the spirit of what this BIM community is all about, um, which is to explore things differently. Um, I have a pretty interesting background uh, in that I was part of the original team that created what was then called Charles River Software. We, we, re we renamed ourselves Revit, uh, and Carol Bartz and Carl uh, and, and all the people over at Autodesk bought us. Uh, I was responsible for about $800,000 worth of sales of Revit at the time that we got purchased, and we got purchased for $133 million. That was a really, really good day, right? That's when I said, screw architecture. I'm going into software. <laughs> <laughs> but what was interesting about the entire experience there was uh, we actually designed Revit not for architects, and it wasn't meant to be a design tool at all. Um, it was meant for a professional that did not exist yet that we know now as virtual design and construction. And the reason why that's important is because of the way that we're using things like building information modeling now to help shape the built environment. Um, we take what we do really seriously, and I think everyone here should actually think about every day when you go to work, we're doing something very noble. You know, uh, it, all the fun stuff that, uh, you know, Ralph and his team are doing with, you know, BIM heroes and that type of thing. You know, some of it's a bit kitschy, especially with the dragons and all that stuff. But I think metaphorically, um, what we do is that we perform a very vital function to keep humans existing on this planet. You have to have fre you know, fresh water, uh, you have to have edible food, but you also need shelter. So no matter what you do, every time you're working on a job site or you're sitting there you know, slinging CAD drawings and BIM models all over the place, at the end of the day, feel proud about that because I do. Uh, you know, it's something noble. Uh, it's something that we leave behind, uh, which is why this type of event is really, really important. You know, the past two and a half years or so with uh, COVID and not being able to see each other like this, and for you people that are hybrid right now, uh, I'm not sure if you're just seeing the stream or if you're actually seeing faces or whatever, that kind of really started to make this event in particular something that I got excited about again, about seeing a live event, right? Um, I even had to learn how to put pants on again. I mean, because, you know, I was sitting there like this because I, I, I was wearing shorts. But, you know, at the end of the day, these uh, exchanges, you know, and the knowledge sharing, I think, is something that's really important. Um, what we do at the Digit Group, we're also known as TDG, is an expansion of that as well. Uh, we do what's called impact investing, uh, meaning that every one of our projects, which, which you'll see uh, towards the end of this session, uh, are based upon something that has an impact on a society, on a community, and or the environment, which means that our return on investment is a lot different than getting a construction loan. Right? Um, our investment is meant for long term, so we get a longer runway. So what you're going to see and, and why we've been uh, successful in, uh, in delivering these types of projects is that we're bringing innovation out. So when I see tools like what uh, you know, Mark and his team does at Esri, those are really, really important things because it's data driven. Right, because every time that I write a check out to one of my consultants that's bringing innovation on board, we're not really sure if it's going to work. Right? Not that we're a big Petri, uh, Petri dish experiment, not at all. But we have to understand that in order to grow, sometimes you've got to take a step backwards as well. And we've done that with innovation. But that's what's driving us, and which is why when we sort of categorize, we put uh, into a taxonomy, how do we start to make decisions about what do we do for either a large-scale mega project or 
in the case of a lot of our work, complete cities. Where do you start, right? Because every city has a different stack of needs. So what we did, we created our own taxonomy based upon 10 principles. And you can read them up here. But uh, you know the, the, the main ones, especially when it comes to water and waste, uh, things like education and healthcare, all of these things are not independent silos, but rather when you stack them, it's almost like if you have individual vertical ways of, 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 of learnt knowledge, you have to find what weaves through those. It's called the urban fabric. And this is where things get really interesting when you start to analyze the data, because no longer are we about analyzing data, especially with reality capture now, about what did we do in the past. It's how can we start getting a crystal ball towards the future? So Mark, really well done when you start showing casing, uh, you know, what are those floodplains? And can we start to anticipate so that we can design better? Right, I mean that, that, that's always the frustrating thing, right? The uh, retrofits, especially in uh, you know my home country here of Ireland. You know, I'm actually really Irish. I know I don't have the accent, but glory be to Jesus, I can turn it on. But uh, it's actually nice to be home. Um, the other thing we do also is that we tie things together when we do get the stacks in place where we have key performance indicators. And those are revolving around things like the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals of the UN, and the new term over the past two and a half years since COVID for publicly traded companies, ESG. Probably the most terrifying three acronyms any Fortune 500 executive wants to hear because it's no longer about your earnings reports. It's how well you're performing with governance, with the environment, and with society. So when you start to measure all these things, you start having conversations with people outside of our industry, it gets to be a very, very rich type of conversation nowadays. Right? So these are the types of examples of work that we do do. Uh, this is Jeddah Economic City uh, on the coast of Saudi Arabia. Um, and the reason why I wanted to show this is, is just the complexity about a project like this. In this case, uh, this is a fully autonomous vehicle city. Uh, there are no uh, uh, combustible, combustible engine cars or vehicles allowed. So you sort of have to park at the periphery and then it's kind of like going to Disneyland where you have the Disney transportation company taking you around on monorails and stuff like that. We took a page right out of, right out of uh, Walt Disney Imagineering for that. The structure in the middle is a one kilometer tall tower. Uh, designed by Smith & Gill, the same architectural firm in Chicago that did the uh, Burj Khalifa, the, the current tallest building in the world today in Dubai. Uh, this is at one kilometer. <laughs> and it's sitting right on the Corniche, where my water table was about six centimeters. So literally what you're looking at is a floating building, because we needed to do the engineering, which was actually done by Thornton Tomasetti in New York City, that this entire building, we sort of designed it after the uh, North Sea crude uh, uh, drilling platforms. And what happens is you actually put these pilings down and then you cap it and it floats and, and because it's a really, really heavy building at one kilometer, right? And it settles itself into the sand and the water. So it's a remarkable piece of engineering that I loved. The reason why we put this into BIM and smart cities is because everything here was done in building information modeling and, and including all the simulations of how do we actually do an autonomous public transportation system? Right, And then how does that affect everything from food delivery to uh, uh, fire, police, all these different things. So it gets to be a very, very fun exercise when you start dealing with cities and then you start to integrate not just the geometry of BIM, but the information modeling of BIM. And I think that's something as we start to move forward now, now that you know the, the pretty pictures are now easily done, right? I mean, uh, of course you still have to have good design to have pretty eye candy, but at the end of the day, where our responsibility as BIM coordinators is, is that I'm telling my, my, my consultants, the Thornton Tomasettis, the Atkins, all these different folks that we work with, to say, I want the data in a very specific way. And the reason why is because I have better tools now to actually do the analysis. I have better tools to start managing a project. I'm going to show, I'm, I'm going to show you what we're doing with blockchain and how we're managing all of our contracts through a smart contract. I need accurate data to make that work. Otherwise, it's a house of cards. So uh, yeah, this is uh, my, my time with Revit. That was a lot of fun. I was actually going to bring it, uh, except that I forgot. <laughs> yeah, and that's another thing about COVID, right? Like, I used to be traveling, and I'd have my go bag, and just it was easy. I knew what to do. I have to think about what I'm packing again. I'm like, 
oh yeah, I forgot my toothbrush. Yeah, they're just like dumb things like that. So hopefully, uh, you know, we're past all of that. One thing I did want to show you though was uh, just a little more about the background uh, because I think it's important as we uh, start going through the next four points that I have. So in 1997, I wrote a book, uh, RS Means the Construction Cost Publishers published it for me. And it was called Cyber Places. Now you gotta understand, in 1996, the internet was America Online or CopyServe. Right? Very few people even knew what a web browser was. So I did a web-based book in 1996, and people didn't know what the hell I was talking about. So as I start to talk about the metaverse and blockchain, you're probably going to have the same thing I had back in 1996 when I was talking about web browsers. But if anything, it's not so much the buzzwords and the jargon, but understand that all this stuff is going to directly affect you because it's not just how the AC industry is using all these new tools. It's the effect of other industries like fintech that are going to be cr crunching down on top of this. So we just need to be aware more than anything. But one of the things I wanted to highlight here was that uh, we worked with the San Francisco Giants Major League Baseball team in the U.S. because they just opened up their new baseball stadium. And we actually did it all in a web browser. And we did it where you could be immersive or you could be augmented, 1996. So we did not call it the metaverse, but uh, we literally wrote the book on how to do this stuff. So let me show you what I mean, by why, why that's important today. There are four major drivers that are directly affecting my business and will directly affect yours. And number one is industrialization. And a lot of that has to do because of the shortage economy. We don't, ha we don't have enough workers especially in the talent market, right? So it's not just the, uh, you know, the tin knockers and the plumbers and electricians. That, that's one big problem. But it's the knowledge of how to build a building. The worst thing BIM has done to our industry is that it makes everything look like it could be built. I can tell you, I have received some, some building information models that it, it, it's unbuildable. I don't know why, wh wh what's happening. It's not about twisty buildings. If I see one more Rhino project with a twisty building, I'm gonna go crazy. Just because you can, don't. Good design is not twisty buildings, right? It's about figuring out the human experience and moving through space. And what does that make, make a person feel? That's something that, that is always going to be something that I know that we're striving for, which goes to number two. The largest driver that I'm seeing in the housing industry and in commercial property is transportation. Isn't that interesting? Right now, uh, President Joe Biden back in June made the, uh, made the Secretary of, of Transportation in charge of all new housing. Why? Because, again, of that stacked layer approach. We have to start thinking differently about transportation. It's not about electric vehicles. It isn't just that. It's about how do you actually move people, goods, products, and services through urban environments smartly. Uh, the third thing, of course, this idea of digital twin in the metaverse, I'll get to it. Uh, and then finally, how do we take what we do as construction documentation, because that's really what belief information modeling is, right? It's to communicate design intent to the constructor on behalf of what an owner wants. Well, that used to be done through drawings and specifications. Now it's being sort of molded into this modeling environment. But eventually, what happens to that digital model? Well, in the world of gaming and this new world that Mark Zuckerberg calls the metaverse, we actually own the digital DNA, not just of the built environment, but of digital real estate. I'm going to show you the valuation now uh, in, in just about five minutes. So let's get back to industrialization. How can we start to incorporate manufacturing processes better than what we do today in order to save time and get higher quality. It's not going to cost you less. Thinking that you're going to build a building in a factory that's going to be, 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 less, be less expensive, um, that's fool's gold. It's not about that. It's about speed to market velocity and meeting market need and having a quality product without having a team of people out in the field. You still need people in the field, but they have different roles. So the way that we did it was that we actually went ahead and looked at our supply chain, especially since we were located in China. <laughs> I used to have hair before COVID. Man, this, this thing has just been unbelievable, right? Because uh, through industrialization, we were able to do this. These are 250 square meter homes. They came off our manufacturing lines in China, in Shanghai, in under seven minutes, fully finished at a quality level that is like from God. Zero defects, zero waste. How did we do it? A lot of pain, a lot of innovation, but boy, did we learn. And what we learned was that we could actually have a one kilometer long shed, raw material on one side, panelization in the middle, and we were in the panelization business. We were not in the home building business. That's been the big mistake of a lot of these big high profile AEC firms like Katera, Skender, and others in the US that took 
billions of dollars and try to manufacture a building. And they failed. Why? Because they have the wrong measure. The measure in industrialization is cycle time and products, not projects. If you go into a mindset that I'm going to do a building, you're, you're, you're going to fail. If you say, I have a bunch of products like panels, pods, these types of things, that in the field, I can actually put them together in a quality manner, now you have a business. So panelization was the thing that we learned. And Forbes magazine took a look at it. They called bull crap on me. We brought them to sh sh Shanghai, and they, uh, and, and they apologized with a, with a really nice uh, 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 series of articles. Now, when you go into the manufacturing business with off-site construction like this, there's a number of other things that we learned. Number one is that you still have your three main uh, sub-trades. You still have your electrical, your plumbing, and your mechanical systems, right? Our fourth utility was IT. We incorporated it as a fourth utility. Why is that important? Well, it means that every one of my buildings are a computer. They're also, they can act as a server, as a storage facility, or actually part of an edge computing platform that allows me not to have data centers, that my buildings are actually the data centers in my downtown areas, and petabytes of data are transferred between the buildings, not between computer servers. Interesting, huh? When you use edge computing and you build it into the built environment in a smart way, you now are making the buildings do things that they normally weren't able to do before, and that is they become alive. In our manufacturing process, what we also learned is that with that fourth utility, uh, the hardest thing in the world is not putting together the panels to create rooms and spaces and staircases and stuff like that. That's the easy stuff. Anything that moves through your building is the hard stuff. Electricity, water, air, and data. Because now all of a sudden, if I have one building and I can connect it to another building, I'm now creating the internet of buildings. That's what we call a smart city. The ability to then have different services, make sure that you have security, um, uh, safety, and entertainment as our top three of, about how we deliver these types of buildings. Um, we're learning every day even more. One of our partnerships is with Amazon and their Alexa team. And it's amazing how we're building in voice commands into our buildings to help the building learn over time your habits, your way of doing things. It's getting out in front of not being reactive to something, but being proactive so that your buildings actually do become smart and start to do things for you. If anyone does have like a Siri or an Alexa back home, right, uh, at first, it was like the spookiest thing, right, because it learns over time your habits and whatnot. But... You know, and I didn't want anyone listening to what I do because I do some freaky things at home. So, you know, I didn't want that going on. But what happened was I can't live without it now. It does certain things. It anticipates my needs. It's a genius platform. When you start to build that not just for my own personal use, but then with my neighbors, with my district and my city, now all of a sudden we're starting to have a decentralized brain that is starting now to think for us. Now, People call that machine learning. Some people call it AI. I know Elon Musk wants to kill it because he's thinking, you know, Terminator. Uh, but that's not where this is going. Um, there are some really, really thoughtful people, teams of people that are doing some interesting work on the real-time capture of information. So I mentioned before about how you can take different buildings and each one of them can be like a different server so that I can start to exchange data. Why is that important? How about there are certain spots with GPS that if I have autonomous vehicles moving through a downtown area, it's too dense, it goes black. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be like on a, 210 bu a two ton bus and it goes black, right? What I want to do is make sure that I have handoffs from my buildings that create these digital corridors and that's how we actually guide our buses. Another thing that that does is that our buses, and we're doing this in Dubai right now with Tesla, what we're doing is we're using a web 3.0 way of engaging the people inside of our cities. So where the World Expo was in Dubai, we're changing that now into a brand new district. We're doing the edge computing thing, but the buildings are static. Tesla cars are going to be our dynamic servers as they enter that space because we can say to you, hey, Mr. Mark, you're Tesla 3. Um, we see that you're only using 20% of the computing power. While you're in our district, can we use the 80 and we'll pay you for that? I don't know about you, but I go buy a Tesla. It's a revenue stream. Where the cities are going to ask and pay you in 
monetary fashion and VIP, NFTs, whatever they're going to be, in order to use your car's computing power as part of an edge computing platform. These are the types of innovations that I'm looking at that just get me so excited that it goes beyond just the cool visualizations and the very nice, you know, buildings that we can create. But it's what else can this thing do? Because if a building becomes a computer and you link your buildings together as the internet of buildings, what are your ideas? Because this is fun now. There's never been a better time to be in this industry because there are no more sacred cows. We're thinking differently and we have to think differently. So uh, two other things I wanted to show you here um, are the ad the, the add-ons that we're doing for uh, our communities. So. I have a lot of capital expense, right? Especially with infrastructure, that I'm not gonna see a return for a very long time, like a wastewater treatment plant. $100 million plant, right? Centralized, I gotta dig, uh, you know, dig up roads and put in pipes, sewer systems and all this stuff. But what would happen if I decentralized that? Hmm. Well, this group in Lexington, Kentucky, uh, led by a nuclear scientist named Dr. Tim Finfrock was introduced to me. And Dr. Tim's technology is being used right now at the International Space Station. What he does is that he cleans water that's dirty. So every time an astronaut goes to the bathroom up in space, they use this technology called Square One Technologies. And what it does is that it goes into a 14-step process. It's about the size of a roller bag. And what it does is it takes any type of dirty water. It could be human wastewater. It could be uh, leachable water from a landfill. It could just be dirty water from a river, right? Or salinization, right? Now, what happens is it breaks down the two H's and the O's, and it breaks apart the, 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 those molecules. When you do that, they want to get back together again, and they get excited. They get angry. It's called a free radical. Those free radicals destroy any other element in its vicinity and then come back together again as what? H2O, water. It self-filtrates water. And it's not reverse osmosis. It's getting down to the molecular level. Really, really cool technology. So we partnered up with them, uh, got them going, and they're now, we have 2,800 units uh, that are deployed in Kenya right now. It's, it's underneath an NGO called Water for the World. Um, and we're going into Rwanda next, then Nigeria, and then Sierra Leone. We're taking uh, all of Sub-Saharan Africa. Why? Well, there's a huge need there because fresh water is really, really tough. It's the reason why we have water-based diseases like Ebola is because we can fix it. And again, that's that impact investing. It's not trying to be like a, you know, a goody-goody guy. No, no, no. There's a real business behind this because once you clean the water, on the other side of the unit is a vending machine. Right now, we're competing against Nestle, Coca-Cola, and uh, Pepsi, uh, where they sell a one-liter bottle of water for a dollar. We're selling it for 15 cents with a 25% with a uh, markup. <laughs> so we're undercutting the market. We're providing an entrepreneurial piece for, the, for, for these people in towns and villages and cities throughout Africa. And what we're doing is we're learning because now our, our biggest... Uh, uh, our largest factory is going to be in Nashville, Tennessee, because of the growth that's happening in that community. Instead of building a wastewater treatment plant, I'm putting every one of these units next to their homes. So they're going to be able to have clean water locally. And because we can then take the decentralized way of doing things, and also then making sure that they work together as, as an ecosystem, we've now created a municipal wastewater treatment plant but decentralized. So that's a big term that I think we should talk about uh, during the panel uh, you know, with, with the jargon is decentralization is the theme for how our community should be looking at innovation and how we start to work together. That it's not about an individual building, it's about the building in context to everything else. So the other thing that this does, which I find just fascinating, is this video. So you see here that there's bubbles coming up out of a bottle of water. You say, so what? I can take a straw and go and get bubbles out of a bottle of water. Through that same process of taking the two H's and the O and at the molecular level, making sure that they're separated, it also creates gas. In the case of you blowing a straw, that's oxygenated bubbles. This is hydrogenated. This, these are very, very dense bubbles, which means you put a light up to it, a flame, it explodes like a hydrogen bomb. But these things are so small, it's like a firecracker, but it's enough energy to turn turbines. What you're looking at is a perpetual engine. This physically should not be happening, but we broke the laws of what we know as physics. This now works. It's a hydrogenated economy. 
every one of our buildings and homes now do not have a gutter system to make sure that rainwater flows out. We want the rainwater floating in as a reservoir because that's our fuel of how we now create energy for every one of our buildings. You want to talk about net zero? <laughs> Hold my beer. This stuff is fun. It exists. Square One Technologies, first time publicly, uh, you, and you guys are seeing it here first. So it's all, it, these are the types of things, again, decentralized energy, decentralized water with cost. So because we only need 12 people to run a line, uh, it, if any one of our factories, uh, we're able to cut our costs down to where we have a profit margin of 38%, and we're selling these for 90,000 US dollars. 2,500 square foot, three bedroom, two bath homes. Affordable housing can happen. It's just a matter now of rethinking how we drive machines and how we have to stop thinking about projects and thinking about products. That's a huge mind shift, but man, I tell you what, this is where BIM sings because that's the digital DNA that's what driving my CNC machines to create the panels. So I can do mass customization because it's the machine telling machines do it this way. So it's all about making mass customization at a, at a very, very high level. Uh, I'm going to quickly go through these only because of time. Uh, this is what I mean about transportation and thinking differently. In this case, uh, I went ahead and went to Tesla, I went to GM, went to Toyota, and I went to... Uh, uh, to Mercedes, and I asked, I need a public transportation system that's autonomous. I have a check, can you do it? And they wanted to sell me autonomous driving cars. I'm like, you're not listening. We don't need more cars, we need a different way of thinking about transportation. So we designed our own system. Uh, I decided to go top shelf and I went to Milan and hired out uh, Pina Farina, uh, the people that designed the Lamborghini. Uh, so what you're taking a look at is uh, an award-winning now uh, public, transpa public transportation system that uh, is being rolled out as, as a proof of concept in February of 2023 in downtown Nashville. So this stuff is happening. Now, what we're doing with Nashville is actually to create the experience. And this is what happened when you put really cool minds together. So this is Lockheed Martin and NASA that took a typical uh, yellow school bus and instead of kids going on a field trip in downtown Washington, D.C., they actually get on the bus and they take the footage from Mars in 360 and they superimpose it as an AR exercise as you drive through downtown D.C. These are the experiences that I'm saying. We have to rethink things. This is moving real estate to me. This is the way that, that we get beyond thinking transportation is transportation and real estate is real estate. When these two things converge, fun things happen because I know if my kid was going to school and I asked, what would you do? He goes, I went to Mars. I'd be like, what? They actually went to Mars, right? Now imagine this is an experience for moving real estate for your favorite restaurant on wheels coming to your home with your favorite chef and plugging in to your kitchen. We've actually experimented with this in China, in Qingdao, where we actually did this for medical, where we had moving medical rooms, exam rooms, MRI machines, those type of things that come to you if you're sick, instead of you as a sick person going to a waiting room in a doctor's office. I never got that. Like, are you trying to make yourself sicker? Okay. So this idea of moving real estate is really fascinating to me, which comes da down to uh, my, my final points here. With BIM, and this idea of a digital uh, twin, right? Uh, we needed to come up with a hierarchy, almost like a way of, of explaining what this thing is. Because when you start to put BIM into a gaming engine, different things are gonna happen. First of all, there's levels of experience and levels of engagement that happen. Because it's no longer you having an audience where you're trying to talk to a subtrade. That's construction documents, and that's one type of engagement. But what happens when that digital DNA gets put into a gaming engine and winds up on Fortnite? Huh. Now things get interesting because now your model has monetary value that goes beyond the design and construction phase. It gets into a life cycle of digital real estate. And that's where we find ourselves trying to demarcate, well, digital twins are literally twins of what should be an as-built, right? And it has its purpose. But as you start to move into these different levels of engagement, uh, we're seeing that these virtual worlds now are appearing that reside in the metaverse. So let me say that again. Virtual worlds are what people are creating by putting things onto a gaming engine. But the metaverse is just outer space. Can you define outer space? There's no there there. That's the metaverse. So it's this environment 
that you stick locations like solar systems, uh, you know, galaxies, planets, and that's the world that we're moving into. So that level of engagement really needs to be defined, and we're trying our best to do that. Because right now with BIM and gaming, I'm learning more and more about how powerful this thing is. We have a virtual reality theme park in Qingdao, China, that's going to be uh, breaking ground in, well, actually it broke ground, but it will be operational December of 2024. This December, we're going live with our metaverse version of it. I'm cutting my construction loan by 18% because I'm receiving revenues before the damn thing's built. Got to start thinking differently. We're actually using a thing called tokenomics. How's that for jargon? Right? And tokenomics is about using things like NFTs, not to have bored apes and have people trade bored apes, but we're taking every family in Revit and creating an NFT around mechanical systems, electrical systems, plumbing systems. The reason why you want to do that, it's empirical data. This is what I mean by a smart contract. If I have good data from all of you and I can fit it into my model and I can create an NFT around that, now I can start to measure things beyond just, it, you know, does it work for one year because of the warranty? No, I have a life cycle approach now to how BIM now works for me economically, and then I can actually take all of those NFTs, because all this is an information model, right? It's not the 3D model, not, not the geometry, but the information model. I now have immutable data, so I know that's exactly where everything is, which means, which means I have a real as-built, finally, for the first time in my life. But the second thing it does is that I can bundle those NFT together, just like stockbrokers take stocks and create mutual funds. I put a wrapper around it, and I make it a security, a fungible token. Do you know what I do with that? I now have digital real estate. I have a working model of what's happening in, in reality. It's measured through NFTs, but my fungible token, I can fractionalize that and have anyone now come in and purchase at a very low cost a piece of digital real estate. These are the new tokenomics that I'm talking about. It's happening really fast. The thing is, all of us here that either create BIM, touch BIM, or manage BIM, that's money that's falling right through our hands and we don't even know it. The fintech world is taking BIM and monetizing it in ways I've never seen before, and it's spinning my head. But this is where everything is going. It's going into this world of, of how do you reuse BIM. In the case of, of The Mandalorian, uh, The Book of Boba Fett, and uh, Obi-Wan on Disney+, Plus. if you've seen any of those, that's how they shot all this stuff. They took BIM and super-injected it into this environment called The Volume, which are just millions of tiny little LED lights that act as a screen, so that you're not using green screen technology and then having computer graphics fix it in post-production. No, 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 no. You're, you're immersed inside of the Millennium Falcon or on Tatooine because they can drop it right in and next, next set, just hit the enter key. So it's changing gaming, gaming's changing Hollywood, and really what we're looking at right now is the emergence of this world of creating virtual worlds, because right now that is the next generation of websites. Websites will still always be there, but the experiences, especially with my son who's 11, and an absolute nut on Fortnite, um, let me give you a statistic, tokenomics. V-Bucks, which is how you purchase skins, different uniforms and weapons and everything, in, in, inside of Fortnite. Last month, they had revenues of $1.2 billion of V-Bucks. $1.2 US billion. This is like a subculture. I think my son accounted for half of that, by the way, but you know, that's another story. But the other thing that happens with virtual worlds is that you have to interface with it. So the largest growth area that we're seeing right now, and the advertising budgets are showing it, avatars. Make yourself a virtual human. In the case of what uh, our friends are doing over at, at uh, Epic Games, check this out. They're actually going metahuman. This is Gabriella. She runs the, the metahuman shop out of San Diego. And what they're doing is that they're doing motion capture of every feature. When she smiles, does she like, you know, have dimples? Does, her, does she get crow's feet around her eyes when she laughs? All these little tiny things now can actually then be shown as a digital equivalent of that person, a digital twin of her, including how she speaks, how she laughs, how she cries. This avatar way of looking at the world is going to affect the construction industry big time because of one big thing. Games never end. There's always Fortnite going on. There's always Minecraft. There's always Roblox. The games never end. You insert yourself into the game with you and your friends, and you define when the game is over for your experience, but the game is still there. Same thing with a construction project. Once we start thinking that our construction project is like a game, 
the only reason why it looks like nothing's going on is because we're human and we have to go home, have dinner, and go to sleep, and then come back the next morning. But the project's still going on. There's experimentation going on right now where we have avatars that work at night, not to swing hammers, but to do reconciles of supply chain, making sure that all the paperwork is done, that all these different things as avatars. So this is happening quick. I'm really surprised about how fast it's happened, but I'm really pleased to see that some of our work now is being seen in the general public. Um, if anyone's seen this last season of Stranger Things uh, the, uh, on Netflix, uh, we had Easter eggs embedded in every scene that the monsters were there. Uh, so like when they were in Russia and that big goblin guy was there, we actually had a QR code down there. If you hit it, it would have opened up a bra uh, an app in the browser on your phone. And this is what you would have seen, is actually the monster not on your 80-inch screen, but coming out of your window, coming up through your couch. And you've got to fight it with your phone as a weapon. So we're having fun with this because we can. And this is where I'd love to see all of you just starting to experiment and thinking differently because this world of digital real estate is real. Uh, we're starting to see that there's three main uses of technology now in our world of BIM. The first one is uh, you know, about project and project teams and product teams and how you manage those things. We're going to hear some great stories. And I can't wait for the next speakers to do that. Uh, we're looking at the fourth utility of how you integrate that so that your building becomes a computer. And then finally, the customer experience, the engagement that you want to have either as a building owner or as a supplier to people that want to create these virtual worlds. I think the world is limitless with this. Um, uh, and uh, just some examples here to show. This is uh, our South Korean studio city. Uh, There's a TV and film production studio that's all digital. Uh, we have one going up in Cape Town, South Africa, and uh, we have one coming up in Los Angeles. The reason why we're doing that is that during a 24-hour day, because it's all digital, TV and, and films now are going to be handed off to each time zone so that we keep production going and actually get streamed services and stream content to you quicker. Because I don't know, I, th I think I've watched everything on Netflix like 50 times. So they want new content, and, that, and that's how we're going about it. Uh, this was actually designed by myself and Atkins. Um, other uses in, in this world of, of metaverse is in Nashville, Tennessee, where they're about to announce the new Major League Baseball team, the Nashville Star stars, uh, re retractable roof, the whole bit. This is going to be in the metaverse. Uh, this was our first real good example of, of it. This is our virtual reality theme park that I talked about in Qingdao. Uh, this is it coming up out of the ground a few months ago. And finally, at the end of the day, I just want to thank um, Esri, Mark, again, th thank you for sponsoring this, to Ralph and the team and for all of you for putting up with me. And uh, with that, my name is Paul, and I'll be around throughout the rest of the day. Thank you very much.